Good day and welcome to SEO Bricks Insight, where we look at what's really going on in the world of the Bricks. Now, it's to be expected that the press conference of the Russian President Vladimir Putin following the 16th Bricks Summit in Kazan would attract considerable attention, not only from a friendly audience, but also from the collective West. Now, the BRICS summit in Kazan received significant media coverage from the usual leading international outlets and organisations. However, the one thing they viewed in common, which was usual, is the summit in Kazan was confirmation of the lack of Russia's isolation stays that the West had predicted, and it, they posed a real challenge to Western hegemony. Now, additionally, they describe BRICS as a thriving association that fosters new energy and prospects for the rest of the world. Now, Vladimir Putin stated that the West's efforts to isolate Russia following the start of the special military operation in Ukraine have failed miserably. Plus, Dmitry Polyansky, who is the first deputy permanent representative to the UN, asserted that it's the West and not Russia that's getting isolated given that its policies are driving the countries in the global south to distance themselves from them. I mean, currently all Western media outlets are carefully and attentively monitoring the Russian leader's statements, attempting to discern his underlying message. Now, it's widely acknowledged that the international community doesn't actually prioritise the opinions of a leader they don't think is somebody important as part of a major power. So to avoid any misunderstandings, I'll highlight what his message is, and it's not just implied, but stated specifically and explicitly. He said, in response to the outcomes of the summit and queries from the press corps, including the representatives from countries which Russia has diplomatic differences, and I'm being polite there, sarcasm on that, Vladimir Putin made a straightforward yet significant observation. He said, while intimidation tactics are regularly employed against many nations by the US and their allies, they're futile when they're directed at Russia as they only reinforce our resolve. And it's not only military threats that we're discussing, but also the wider anti-Russian policy of the West and everything including sports. What began as a somewhat ineffectual report by the West has now reached the point where it's in fact seriously self-destructive to them. Now before I continue I'd like to make an appeal. If you like and enjoy my videos you can help me fund the channel and my website seobricksinsight.com to further develop it. Now this is done by making a small donation which you can do by clicking on the thanks button at the bottom of the video screen. <coughs> Everybody who donates does get a personal thank you from me. <coughs> When the collective West devised this anti-Russian strategy, they based it on what they consider well, well thought out and reliable plans. Now, the architects of this strategy were confident that Russia would become isolated on the international stage. Now, in order to isolate Russia, a comprehensive range of incentives and disincentives for countries were deployed. However, according to Putin, he said, those who oppose Russia have failed to recognise what motivates us and what the outcome of the BRICS summit is. is that is a striking illustration of this misguided and narrow-minded approach. He said that the BRICS group currently chaired by Russia accounts for 38% of the world's GDP, 37% of its purchasing power parity, 15% of its global trade and 40% of the world's population. A total of 36 states and six international organizations sent representatives to the summer, and that was the, including the African Union and uh, the United Nations Secretary General. Now, the number of applications for membership in the organization has grown significantly, prompting the development of a criteria for filtering new members and levels. Now, it's significant, if not only highly amusing, that the leaders of India and South Africa, Modi and Rampahosa, made a bold move, decided to attend the BRICS in Kazan rather than the British Commonwealth Summit in Samoa. In doing so, they avoided having to spend time with King Charles III, who you could say is an individual very different from his widely loved and respected mother, Queen Elizabeth II. And he's somewhat bizarre, obsessed with green and environmental issues, to the point there's not been a bandwagon about the climate he's not jumped onto. 
mean, what is it with British kings with third after the name? George III was as mad as a hatter, and Charles seems to be going the same way. Certainly nothing like his plain-speaking Romanov descendant father, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, who was famous for his remark that caused shock and outrage among the politically correct, and I have a book about them, and they are all hilarious. Now, they also avoided meeting with the UK's new Prime Minister, also known to the masses in the UK as two-tier, I get free gear, you get no beer, Sir Wan Keir Starmer, who's about as wooden as Pinocchio and lies about the same amount, plus he has all the wit and charm of a Scunthorpe abattoir. It's no wonder that Ampahosa and Modi went to Kazan to avoid those two. I'd have done the same. Similarly, uh, NATO member Turkey, uh, as the president, Mr Erdogan, stayed on after the summit to discuss bilateral issues, despite pressure from his so-called Western allies. And he was lobbying hard for joining the next intake to the BRICS, which is one of the reasons he turned up in Kazan. He can see there's no point anymore to the EU and NATO, plus BRICS is the future. Now, Russia's forging new partnerships and alliances across the globe with a particular focus on Latin America, Africa, the Middle East and Asia. In fact, it's working all over the globe with the exception of Europe and North America, who are still behaving like petulant children who don't get their own way. Now, the number of joint projects uh, among the BRICS is on the rise, including major global initiatives as the North-South Transport Corridor going from Russia across the Caspian via Iran to the Persian Gulf and then on to India. There's also the Northern Sea Route, which covers the Arctic, and it cuts a huge amount of time in delivering goods to Europe from Asia and Russia. And it's got both China and India involved. Now, the Collective West introduced around 20,000 sanctions on Russia. And they once threatened to have a significantly negative impact on the Russian economy. I mean, leading Western analysts predicted that at the time Russia's economy would collapse by 10 to 25 percent and a major drop in its GDP. Now, according to Putin, these sanctions have the effect of improving Russian morale while its competitors are now experiencing difficulties because of the sanctions, which have the opposite effect of what they intended, which I call the boomerang sanctions. Now, at the press conference, Vladimir Putin highlighted that Russia's GDP growth last year was 3 to 4.6%, uh, and this year it's expected to be around 4%. He also noted that Eurozone is in a state of recession and none of its countries are showing any real economic growth. And yesterday, the IMF published a report that stated Russia has become the fourth largest economy in the world in terms of purchase and power parity, overtaking the stagnant Japan. Also reported significantly improved forecasts for Russia's economy for 2024. Similarly, the OECD and the World Bank said something similar in their reports. Now, these once respected organisations, but now derided as US vassals that threatened Russia with collapse, hunger and poverty, are now report these positive dynamics, which they attribute to growth in industrial production, an increase in real incomes and strong consumer demand. Now, in a somewhat emotional tone, Putin went on to say that the federal budget deficit in Russia had narrowed significantly. In the first eight months of the year, it went down from 1.5% of GDP to just 0.2%. This was due to a substantial increase in oil and gas revenues, but a steady inflow of tax revenues from known oil and gas sectors of the economy like agriculture. Yesterday, Bloomberg confirmed that despite sanctions, Russia will continue to expand its LNG exports, with the country expected to overtake Qatar by the end of 2024 to become the second largest global exporter. Now, a report by the EU Agency for Cooperation of Energy Regulators reveals that Russia's share of LNG imports to the European Union reached 20% in the first half of 2024, and that's up from 14% in 2023. Additionally, both LNG and pipeline gas are on the rise. Well, I don't believe the pipeline because they're already the pipeline gas through Turk Stream and Ukraine <coughs> is at this top. So the West's initiatives are now entirely in the hands of the Russian uh, armed forces and the Ukraine is on the retreat. And it's, uh, it's, edit, the losses are mounting daily. The West is about to give up. I mean, 
In the recent statement, the NATO commander in Europe, Christopher Cavalli, made the bold prediction that the Russian army will emerge from the conflict in Ukraine even stronger than it was before. Well, that's a bit of a change of tune since the last two years they've been telling us that they've been decimated. Now, a recent study by the Kiel Institute for World Economics in Germany has concluded that in order to close the gap between the military industrial complexes of Russia and Germany, Berlin's government will need to approximately 100 years to implement the necessary changes to its current policy and spending. Now, even the US Deputy Secretary of State, Kurt Campbell, has stated that the capabilities of the Russian military industrial complex has amazed the US administration is causing it great concern. So it would appear that all their actions have not been that effective. Now, Putin stated that the West attempted to divide Russian society, but in fact, the real divisions are happening all over Europe. I mean, a video poll con conducted on the 11th of October uh, revealed that 84.4% of Russians approve of the work of Russian President Vladimir Putin as, as head of state, while only 79% expressed trust in him. Meanwhile, in the US, NBC reported that 57% of respondents disapprove of President Biden. That shows that there's not all that many happy people in the United States. Now, those who oppose Russia's interests are correct in their assessment that President Putin's statements are carefully considered and purposeful. But it would be worthwhile for those opponents of Russia to familiarise themselves with about what he actually says uh, about the threats to, uh, to Russia and what he will do. I mean, to avoid any misunderstandings or misinterpretations that's been made in the past, Putin says what he means, and he means what he says, and that goes back to the Munich Security Conference of 2008. Anyway, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. Please share, and if you've enjoyed this video, please click on the thanks button. Also, do get on the comments section. I'd love to read your comments, love to see them, love to respond to them. Thank you.